Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week, and it's a big one as we're less than 24 hours away from Starship Flight 6, as SpaceX prepare to try and catch Super Heavy for the second time. All this didn't stop them flying six Falcon 9 missions for a variety of customers last week, and there are also three launches from China, Stoke Space revealed their new engine in their new test stand, altitude chamber tests for the Artemis II Orion spacecraft began, and Blue Origin mated New Glenn's first and second stages. All of this and so much more, so sit back and enjoy. Things are getting exciting down at Starbase. We're mere weeks since the historic Flight 5, which saw SpaceX nail the catch of Super Heavy on their very first attempt, and of course saw an on-target ocean landing for the Starship as well. And yet we're already getting ready to watch SpaceX do it all over again. Tomorrow, in fact. Yep, the announcement came from SpaceX last week that they're targeting no earlier than Tuesday the 19th of November for Flight 6. It'll largely be the same as Flight 5, but with a few differences. One big way in which the launch will be better to watch is that it's going to launch later in the day compared to previous flights, so that the ship re-enters during the day, to give us a better view of what will hopefully be another successful flip and landing burn in the Indian Ocean. The Starship will be coming in hotter though. It's going to re-enter the atmosphere at a steeper angle to test the limits of those control flaps. Another big difference with the ship is that it will attempt the first Raptor engine in space burn to test the Starship system for future deorbit burns, though this flight will be suborbital like the ones that came before. So yes, NASA can still say SLS is the most powerful orbital rocket for now, I guess. <laughs> the most exciting part of the flight though is unchanged. That's of course seeing the Super Heavy get caught by the chopstick arms of the Starbase Tower hopefully with equal levels of success as Flight 5. SpaceX also plan on offloading residual propellant from the Soup Heavy faster than before, provided the catch is made. If health checks aren't 100%, the booster will abort the catch and land in the Gulf of Mexico instead. But I'm hopeful it won't. Flight 5 was obviously a success, and SpaceX have taken the lessons learned on that flight and upgraded the booster's propulsion redundancy, strengthened some of its structural elements, and have enhanced the software controls for safer booster return and catch. The progress with Starship is truly incredible. Just as incredible as the universe of Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus, who have sponsored today's video. If you're a fan of Warhammer, or if you're just looking for a new tactical strategy challenge, you'll love what Tacticus has to offer. Tacticus brings the intense, high-stakes battles of Warhammer 40,000 right to the palm of your hand. You'll assemble and lead a powerful team of champions, each from one of many diverse playable factions, and use lightning-fast tactical skills to control every move on the battlefield. The game includes PvE campaigns, competitive PvP, live events, and even guild raids for team-based challenges. Whether you're completely new to Warhammer or a long-time fan, you will find plenty to sink your teeth into, and enough variety to keep every battle exciting. Since its release, Snowprint Studios has been constantly adding fresh content and new features. With over 50 champions and a massive 18 playable factions, there are endless strategies to explore. If you use the code NOVHELLO, then you can claim 2,000 gold and 50 black stones for free, available until the 1st of December. Follow the link below. Thank you so much to Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus for sponsoring today's video. The past week saw all the pre-flight boxes ticked off. Things began on Tuesday with the rollout of Ship 31 from the high bay, sporting a clean S31 logo in addition to a pixel banana dude holding a real scale banana for scale. <laughs> it couldn't be stacked yet though, as, and I don't know if you can tell it from this picture or not, but there was no soup heavy for it to be stacked onto. That little oversight was fixed on Thursday, with the rollout of Booster 13 from the Mega Bay, sporting its newly installed hot stage ring. It was moved to the launch mount at the pad, where it was then lifted and stacked onto the ring. From there, SpaceX wasted no time in stacking Ship 31 on top, completing the Starship Flight 6 full stack. Yesterday saw the completion of propellant load tests and pre-flight checkouts, followed by official announcement from SpaceX that they are ready for flight. 
So I guess no full stack static fire for us this time. The flight will be streamed on Twitter. X. The window will open at 4 p.m. Central Time, and the webcast will start about 30 minutes before liftoff. I've put a link in the description for you to bookmark ahead of time. The Flight 6 full stack is big. Not many people realize how big it is, but here's a Boeing 737 next to it for size. Okay, I joke, but it's a cool shot from NASA Space Flight's Max Evans, and the aircraft is a SpaceX one. It's their 737 that they fly mainly from Los Angeles to shuttle SpaceX staff from California to Starbase. Prior to the full stack, SpaceX tested the water deluge system at the launch pad, and once the full stack was there, we saw a ship quick disconnect retraction test, much like what we saw one week prior, though obviously with the ship there this time. Furthermore, Max Evans caught a shot of some grid fin testing on Booster 13. These would allow the ship to steer itself back to the tower, just like Falcon 9's grid fins. Jack Byer, also from NASA Spaceflight, captured this, the moment we'd all been waiting for, the installation of the Booster Flight Termination System. This is the very last thing that gets installed before a launch, since it's the vehicle's self-destruct system, which again solidifies that launch window no earlier than tomorrow. Last week could be described as Falcon 9 Mania, with a massive six launches taking place, and another one due around this video's release, so not able to be included in today's episode, unfortunately. Things began on Monday, Day, where we saw a Falcon 9 launch the KoreaSat 6A satellite to a geosynchronous transfer orbit from Pad 39A at Kennedy. The satellite is operated by Korea Telecom Corporation and will join their fleet of communication satellites delivering fixed and broadcast services to South Korea. Falcon 9's first stage had enough propellant remaining to do a return to launch site landing, touching down on landing zone 1, completing its 23rd overall mission. Now, we've come very close to a Falcon booster making it to 25 launches, but so far none have survived long enough. Will this one, 1067, finally be the one to do it? Let me know what you think in the comments below. The same day as the Korea Sat 6A mission, less than four hours later in fact, was another Falcon 9 launch, this time from Kennedy Pad 40, with 24 Starlink satellites on board. There were a total of four Falcon 9 Starlink missions over the week actually, so I might just cover them all together, since they're all basically the same. The Starlink launches were on Monday, you know, the one I just mentioned, and then again on Thursday, twice in fact, with the first launching from Vandenberg Space Force Base, California, and the second launch from Pad 40 at Kennedy, Florida. And then we had another Starlink launch earlier today, once again from Vandenberg. All four first stage boosters successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ships. The landing we saw earlier today was also this particular booster's 20th overall landing. In total, SpaceX delivered 88 Starlinks to orbit across the week. In the midst of all the Starlink missions, on Sunday we saw a Falcon 9 liftoff from Cape Canaveral Pad 39A, carrying the TD-7 mission to a geosynchronous transfer orbit. TD-7, also known as Optus X, is a communication satellite for Australian telecommunications company Optus, which will join Optus's network in providing services across Australia and New Zealand. Following stage separation, Falcon 9's first stage landed on the short fall of Gravitas drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean, completing its 16th flight. It's so insane to see one company launching one rocket so frequently. Imagine how weird it'd be to see two Vulcan launched in one week, let alone more than that, like we frequently see with Falcon 9. A big part of Falcon 9's success is down to, of course, the fact that the first stage can be recovered and reflown, as well as the fairings, something that nobody else has ever managed. But Blue Origin have been cooking with their enormous New Glenn vehicle, which will also have a reusable first stage, but with a much greater payload capacity than Falcon. And after so many years of waiting, we are now tantalizingly close to the maiden flight of this thing. Last week, Blue Origin shared this photo, showing that they have now mated New Glenn's first and second stages. CEO Dave Limp also jumped in, sharing this photo of the second stage's twin BE-3U engines, which, in the vacuum of space, will release hydrogen-rich steam at speeds of roughly 10,000 miles an hour. He also elaborated that these nozzles are big, roughly 3 meters long. I am super excited to see New Glenn finally launch. Hopefully they stick the landing on the first try. Do you think they'll still meet the deadline to launch in 2024? Not many days are left in the year now. Now it wasn't just SpaceX launching stuff last week. We also saw three launches from China. On Monday, we saw a Kinetica 1 rocket launch, sporting a 3.35 meter fairing for the very first time. It carried 15 payloads to space, all of them from Chinese institutions for various purposes, bar one, which was a satellite from Oman of which not a lot is known other than the fact it's for Earth observation. Wednesday saw the launch of a Long March 4B, 
carrying an ocean salinity observing satellite for the Chinese Ministry of Natural Resources. Now, China does have a bit of a history with its spent rocket stages crashing anywhere, really, including some nasty impacts in populated areas. It looks like they're trying to improve things, though, as the first stage of this rocket was equipped with grid fins to, in official words, mitigate the impacts on possible landing area, or in real terms, make sure it steers itself clear of any populated areas before impact. The third and final launch from China was a beefy Long March 7, carrying the seventh cargo resupply mission to the Tiangong space station with the Tianzhou 8 spacecraft. This launched on Friday, and the spacecraft reached the station just over three hours later, docking to the station's aft port, replacing the Tianzhou 7, which departed on the 10th of November. Artemis II made another step forward. The Orion crew module was placed in the altitude chamber inside the Neil A. Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, which simulates deep space vacuum conditions. And the testing will provide additional data to augment the data gained during testing earlier this summer. The spacecraft will carry NASA astronauts Victor Glover, Christina Koch, and Reed Weissman, as well as Canadian Space Agency astronaut Jeremy Hansen, on a 10-day journey around the moon and back for the Artemis to test flight. Stoke Space has shared their new engine on their new test stand, installed in under one hour. A lot of that um, hardware mess, for want of a better description, is mostly sensors and test-related stuff. I'm sure we'll see it evolve like we did with Raptor 1 to 2 to 3. Their previous test stand was horizontal rather than vertical. Here's a test from July. These engines will power the first stage of Nova, Stoke's fully reusable medium lift rocket currently in development. They are serious contenders to Falcon 9 and eventually Starship if they can get this working like they want it to, and I always get excited when Stoke share stuff like this. Laon Aerospace was sort of back in action last week. I made a little video in which I spitballed some takes on the current state of Kerbal Space Program, Kitten Space Agency, and Kerbal Space Program 2. I had planned on a bigger, proper mission, but unfortunately I... Sorry, I didn't want to jump scare you like that. Your computer is fine. But mine wasn't. I had this horrid blue screen of death happen to me. Rest assured, I immediately set about backing everything up. And I've run loads of tests on my drives, RAM, and all the other components that can be tested and monitored. And so far, everything looks fine. So I'm really not sure what happened. And I've not had a blue screen of death since. But all that took a lot of work, and so I couldn't get the video done in time for Saturday. Rest assured though that this Saturday is definitely on track for the video. It's going to be a space shuttle video. It's going to be a space shuttle video with a fun twist, so look forward to that. But that is the end of today's video. I do hope you enjoyed it. And once again, massive thanks to Warhammer40,000 for sponsoring. Scan that QR code or click the link in the description to check it out. And of course, use the code NORTHHELLO to claim 2,000 gold and 50 black stones for free, available until the 1st of December. I also got to say a massive thanks to all my supporters on the right there. If your name is there, then check Patreon for early access to Saturday's video. But that's it. Thank you so much again for watching, and... Goodbye for now.